on this Friday evening. I'm so pleased, I'm pleased so many to know your face. It's fantastic. Um, my name is Dr. Shane Edwards. I'm head of the Department of Humanities, Social Science, and Dublin Business School. Um, and within, the, within that department falls psychology, social science, social studies, and lots of very interesting programs. Um, we also have a um, department of psychotherapy, and in that we've got postgraduate programs within the area of counseling and psychotherapy. I'm very, very, very pleased to introduce Dr. Rick uh, Lose, and he will be giving a, uh, a talk tonight on the DSM. Um, Rick has actually been involved within our department for, for many, many years. That's no reflection on his age, but he's very, <laughs> uh, uh, very experienced within the area. He is, and I, keep, um, uh, and I keep remembering this, that he is actually a trained clinical psychologist. He actually completed his training within Amsterdam. He then went on to um, complete training within psychoanalysis within Belgium. And we were very, very lucky to have him involved and a very integral um, member of the team within introducing psychoanalysis within our psychology programs here. So I'm going to hand you over to Rick, he's going to give a fantastic and a very interesting talk. And then what will happen is we'll open the floor for some questions um, after the talk's finished. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Sinead. That's okay. uh, something to live up to, what you said there at the end. So uh, uh, I just I'd like to start by uh, uh, saying that I'm really, really honoured uh, to be here to be able to uh, deliver this lecture on the DSM. Uh, you know, honoured to, to be able to do that in in a, a PSI and uh, NIBPS uh, context, and uh, it's. Um, it's not such an, an obvious uh, thing to do uh, because I am a, a, a member of the Psychological Society of Ireland, uh, but my, my work is predominantly within uh, uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis, within the World Association of Psychoanalysis and the new Lacanian School, uh, our, our local group. Uh, so, uh, so it's a, a, a real... Uh, a real honor for me uh, to be able to talk about something that uh, I, I am worried about uh, and I think many psychologists, uh, clinical psychologists, uh, psychiatrists are also uh, worried about this. Uh, so uh, an article was written uh, not too long ago, I got it in my uh, mail uh, box at home, my letterbox uh, a couple of weeks ago in the Irish Psychologist, uh, an article by, uh, as you can see, Tom Pender, Amy Watchorn, Stephen Quigley and Patrick Ryan, uh, and it's a review of the classification systems for mental health distress, in, uh, so published literally uh, very recently in 2014. Uh, I say that because, uh, or I mentioned this article for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, it's very good, uh, it's uh, very calm, it's very measured, and it explains extremely well what the concerns are uh, regarding the DSM, including the latest edition of the DSM, the DSM-5. And uh, these concerns are worldwide. Uh, and uh, so uh, what this article uh, lays out, I think, very, very well is precisely those concerns. And uh, in a way, uh, it, it meant that kind of <laughs> half my work was done, but it was precisely an opportunity for me because uh, it allowed me to, to talk about something that, uh, that uh, is close to my work and to my heart, and that is... Uh, you know, I obviously share the worries about uh, about the DSM, uh, but uh, is there um, is there uh, another way of uh, of thinking uh, or rethinking uh, the question of classification and diagnosis? Because I, I really think uh, we cannot do without. I think it is absolutely uh, crucial, and and I say that because th there are some quarters. Uh, for example, uh, in critical psychology and uh, critical psychiatry, psychiatry uh, 
uh, where, uh, where one wants to do away with diagnosis and, and classification. And I, I think that is a problem. So it allows me to talk a little bit about uh, those kinds of questions, those kinds of, uh, uh, those kinds of issues. And it allows me to uh, talk a little bit, and I'll, I'll do this in, in, uh, as non-conceptually uh, as I can, a little bit about what we do in psychoanalysis in the orientation of Lacan, uh, in terms of diagnosis and symptoms, in terms of psychopathology. Again, yeah, this this uh, article. So this article is is very well written, very calm and measured. Uh, unlike uh, another uh, uh, book, this one here, I have it with me because I want to quote one thing from it uh, by uh, James Davis. Uh, the book is called Frack, it came out recently in 2013, and uh, it's. Um, uh, it's kind of uh, sensationalist, I think, and uh, it's uh, like, uh, I don't know whether anyone of you is familiar with it, but it's, it's like no. investigative uh, journalism. And I must say, the article in the Irish Psychology, uh, Psychologist, which is only five pages, I learned a lot more than I did from, from this book which I read. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole book. Uh, it deals uh, a lot, for example, with, uh, uh, well, the first two or three chapters are on the DSM, and then uh, it deals a lot with the connections, for example, between uh, the DSM committee and the pharmaceutical industry, and that uh, many people on the committee of the DSM were paid, for example, by the pharmaceutical industry. Interesting and, and, and important, but what, what I would like to do, uh, what I've decided to do uh, is... Um, is to try and look at the DSM on its own terms, in, in the sense of what what may be wrong with it. So, uh, what I'm going to do is the following uh, tonight in this uh, in this lecture. Uh, I'm going to very briefly mention the five criticisms uh, from the article of the Irish psychologist. Uh, and um, I'll do this very, very succinctly and very briefly because the, the five criticisms are laid out, as I said, very, very well and very clearly. Then I will uh, discuss uh, uh, some limitations to the DSM, what I call structural limitations. Uh, and uh, so these are, you could say, added criticisms uh, uh, one of which is my own, uh, <coughs> and one that is not mentioned in the uh, Irish psychologist article, but uh, it's, a, it's a generally fairly well-known criticism. But as I say, I will add one uh, structural problem that, that is contained within the DSM uh, to, to it. Uh, so after that, um, I will talk about what is classification or rather diagnosis in the orientation of Lacan. Uh, I will then talk about uh, what is a symptom and how does a symptom, a psychological symptom, how does that, for example, relate uh, to uh, what we call a structure, uh, a clinical structure or a diagnostic category in the way we, we uh, use it in... Um, in, uh, in psychoanalysis in the orientation of Lacan uh, and then I, I will conclude I'll, I'll try and finish before 7 uh, but I'll also try and, and uh, make room for some questions or comments <coughs> or uh, criticisms and so on so um, just very briefly, uh, I, I, I said structural limitations of the DSM, so uh, that by implication means that I think the DSM leads to a clinical impasse. Is that the case? Uh, uh, that's, of course, an important question to ask. And I think that is the case. Uh, for example, the British Psychological Society uh, uh, concluded that uh, uh, clients general public are negatively affected uh, by, um, uh, by the, the, the DSM and, and uh, by the sort of uh, medicalization that is implicated in, uh, in using the DSM. So uh, uh, in other words, what one is afraid of, uh, and again this is part of the B BPS uh, position, and I think it is also part of the PSI position, is that uh, 
uh, let's say, variant human behavior, because not all humans behave in exactly the same way, um, that variant human behavior will be pathologized. Uh, uh, and uh, again, that, that is a concern and should be of great uh, concern to us, I think. And um, so, uh, by implication, uh, I, in a way, I think, and this is another thing that I would like to show, in fact, it's one, one, one of the structural limitations uh, of, of the DSM that I'm adding to the uh, Irish Psychologist article, is uh, that what is excluded from uh, the, the DSM is the question of subjectivity. Uh, and by that I mean n not just feelings and emotions and, uh, you know, that we all experience, but I actually mean uh, uh, subjectivity in the, in, the, in the sense of subjective responsibility. I'll come back to this, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, human being may well be subjectively implicated in uh, some of what makes us suffer. Uh, so, very briefly, uh, to outline uh, the criticisms from the uh, Irish psychologies, uh, psychologist. Um, so, uh, well, uh, one, uh, one thing uh, they say is that uh, uh, a diagnosis based on the DSM classification system can lead to uh, uh, a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. And in other words, uh, from then on, once that is diagnosed, everything... Uh, fits into the, the, the category. Two, that diagnoses uh, can become stigmas. In other words, that one is totally identified with the diagnosis that was, that was made. So, uh, you know, as let's say somebody who suffers from an agoraphobia, you're still a human being. Uh, and there's other aspects to you. Uh, likewise, with uh, schizophrenia or uh, other forms of psychosis, uh, for example. That's the issue or problem of uh, reification. Three, uh, what they uh, outline very well and argue very well in that article is uh, that uh, reliability and validity is low. Uh, these are uh, two concepts that I will return to very briefly. Um, but uh, as you know, uh, your, your psychologist's uh, reliability has to do with is it reliable, is our diagnosis reliable? In other words, do we agree with each other? Uh, it's uh, more specifically known as inter-rater uh, reliability. And validity is then more to do, does it measure what it is meant to be measuring or what it pretends it measures. And, uh, and what, they, what these authors uh, say, the Irish psychologist, is, is that these, uh, these two uh, measurements are low. The DSM does not do so well, which is interesting, of course, because um, we're still continuing with it. And uh, we're, <coughs> trying, we're trying to uh, enhance uh, or improve uh, the validity and the reliability. We've, uh, it looks like uh, become a little bit more successful with reliability because we have managed uh, uh, with uh, uh, with the DSM-5 to create a clearly coded language uh, so that the uh, uh, raters agree more on the basis of a very clear language. However, um, a problem is still validity. Uh, rather, in fact, uh, I, I, I don't think many re much research has been done yet on the DSM-5, but I predict that validity is going, uh, is going to get worse uh, because there is something about the clear language that uh, I think does not relate to the clinic on the ground. The last... Uh, uh, no, sorry, the fourth uh, aspect uh, uh, that uh, 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 criticism of the DSM is that the DSM has uh, financial, legal, and um, uh, and uh, financial legal. Uh, there's uh, financial legal, and there's another. Uh, um, no, sorry, it is financial. Financial and legal implications. Financial, um, uh, in the sense, for, for example, uh, that uh, 
uh, you uh, get uh, insurance uh, if you're a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist in the United States, that is predominantly, uh, uses, has been able to use a DSM uh, diagnostic category to diagnose the, the patient. So that's, that's, a, that's a serious implication in a way. Um, there's a, another financial aspect, that's why I thought there were three. There's another financial aspect, and that is that, uh, that uh, most research funding goes in the direction of investigating uh, DSM categories rather than other options uh, in terms of thinking about diagnosis. The legal implications uh, are, for example, that uh, uh, in order to um, uh, say if you have committed a crime and uh, uh, it, it, the DSM, a DSM diagnosis uh, is often required by the uh, by the judge or the juridical system in order to uh, in order to deal or look at the question of uh, of moral responsibility for the crime. So these are these are serious uh, implications. The last one, uh, the last criticism, um, is that um, uh, is the, it concerns the question of comorbidity. Uh, that uh, of course there are. There, you know, uh, people can suffer from various kinds of mental illnesses. Uh, that has always existed. It will always exist. What is the problem here? Well, the problem is not so much comorbidity in itself, but it is precisely the uh, problematic uh, and indeed very arbitrary criteria that distinguish between uh, the various um, uh, pathologies. Uh, and that, so therefore that becomes a problem. It's as if there is a continuum uh, at work in, in the DSM and thus it becomes arbitrary. So, so far, the five criticisms as they were uh, outlined very well in the Irish Psychologist article. So the authors uh, conclude their article with the following comment. I uh, quote, uh, a radical alternative approach would be to discard classification altogether. However, we believe this, uh, this would create more problems than it would resolve. And I have to say that uh, I, I com completely agree with that. You should never throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, and uh, uh, we need diagnosis. We need to know what we're doing. If we're doing a treatment, we need to know what we're doing. It's really, really crucial. It's really important. Let me just quote... From this book, it's uh, the only time I'll do this. Uh, this is, uh, again, the book uh, that I mentioned, Cracked by James Davis. And uh, he quotes a man co called Dr. Sami Tamimi. I, only, I, I haven't got this on my slide because I only read this this morning. And uh, he is a, a consultant psychiatrist and he is a director of medical education in the NHS in the UK. And he says this, and I think he comes... Uh, from the context I, uh, I, I uh, gleaned this, I think he comes from, uh, from the corner of critical psychiatry. He says, and I quote, what the evidence shows, according to Timimi, so I'm quoting Davis, talking to Timimi, what the evidence shows, according to Timimi, is that what matters most in mental health care is not diagnosing problems and prescribing medication, but developing meaningful relationships with sufferers with the aim of cultivating insight into their problems so the right interventions can be individually tailored to their needs. In other words, I mean, it's, it sounds good, uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, but I think there is a problem in, in that statement. And, and the problem is uh, that he, uh, by implication, I think he is saying that he effectively wants to do away with diagnosis and classification. And that, I think, is a problem. Uh, so certainly it would not be uh, m my position, uh, and it would not be the position, let's say, of, of uh, the colleagues uh, that, that I work with in, in, in our groups in, in uh, psychoanalysis and Lacanian orientations. So, um, so there are... Uh, I, I do think the DSM is a problem. I think the DSM, as I said, is leading in the way it is set up and the way it is logically structured, 
uh, leads us into a clinical impasse, uh, sometimes even with devastating consequences, and that's also what I want to kind of analyze a little bit in terms of the DSM. So, uh, what, what are they? I'm going to mention two <coughs> structural limitations uh, that, that I think are part of the DSM. Um, First of all, the DSM-5 is a continuation of the DSM-4 in that both uh, are an attempt to represent uh, mental disorders as medical problems with biological causes. Uh, it's, uh, it's stated in, in, in the various uh, documentation that uh, we're looking at medical causes, biological markers for the various kind of syndromes uh, and uh, con uh, psychopathological conditions. That's, that's, as I say, officially stated, but that's interesting in the light of, uh, of what they say, namely that, uh, that, uh, that their descriptive approach uh, is neutral, that they would like to have a neutral uh, approach, so they are not favoring one way or another, one theory over another theory, or one approach to another approach. That's curious because uh, it means, in a way, anything goes except it has to be biologically based. That's by implication, again, what, what, what that means, I think. So, a biologically based medical model. Now, this idea of explaining, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, medical problems, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say, mental problems, uh, on, on the basis of uh, an organic lesion or, uh, or uh, on the basis of an organic problem or cause has existed for a long time, of course. Why, uh, why is that? Well, because in the 19th century, uh, there is a, a fundamental change took place in medicine, uh, in France, actually, in Paris, and uh, to, to put it uh, crudely, uh, in the 19th century, suddenly somebody had the idea in, uh, to open up the corpses of the people who died of diseases. And so we open up the, cor uh, the corpses in order to see what is, uh, what's the lesion, what's the cause of the symptom that one can see uh, on the surface of the body. So with that we have surgery, for example. So we go into the body to try and do something about, uh, uh, about this symptom that is uh, manifest on the outside of the body. So medicine, physical medicine, was unbelievably successful uh, in the 19th century and from then on. Because uh, physical medicine is very successful in terms of its research. Uh, it has discovered extraordinary things. What we have tried to do is we've tried to replicate this in psychiatry in the sense that we wanted a similar success in a similar way. So we were uh, looking, uh, let's say, uh, for organic lesions within the uh, nervous system uh, and within the brain in order to locate the cause uh, of, the, of the specific mental illness and uh, the results have been very disappointing. And don't take my word for it. Uh, they, uh, this is uh, generally accepted. Uh, uh, this is, again, officially stated by the APA, uh, the most powerful psychiatric uh, organization in the world, the American Psychiatric Association. <laughs> uh, I will quote uh, uh, a man uh, from that organization, a man called Professor Pardes, uh, in a minute, but just to say it's actually remarkable uh, that we have made so little progress uh, because between DSM-4 and DSM-5 we have fMRI uh, uh, scanning uh, we can look into the brain and so uh, we've te technologically we've made unbelievable progress in terms of physical medicine we made enormous progress and it keeps continuing and for psychopathology and its causation, very little result. So it is really disappointing. Um, so, um, as I say, uh, despite all these uh, incredibly important and exciting uh, developments, uh, 
uh, very little progress was made. Pardes, Professor Pardes, he's former chair of the Department uh, of Psychiatry in Columbia University. Uh, he said last year, so very recently, uh, that um, uh, we still don't have any tests uh, you know, for uh, finding biological causes and um, we have no objective biological data uh, to test uh, diagnostic uh, categories. Uh, so this, this is one of the most, you could say, important, I'm not sure, one of the most eminent, uh, but he's, he's very powerful, uh, people in the APA in, uh, in the United States. We, we've made no progress. So in other words, uh, I, I personally don't think that means that uh, we shouldn't try, because I, I do think that the uh, logical positivist method of doing science is our gold standard. Uh, and has to be our gold standard. Uh, the, the, only, the only problem is, and again that's something we can discuss if you wish, is that uh, as a method it may not apply to everything. I think there is a problem uh, with, uh, uh, with the mind and with psychopathology. That's, that's where uh, it seems to lead into an impasse. So... Um, What's curious uh, about uh, the situation is that when the, the connection, the, the cause of the illness, the biological cause of the illness, and the symptom of the illness, the illness itself, has not been established, one uh, says that one hopes uh, that this will uh, take place sometime in the future. And that's, that to me strikes... Uh, that strikes me as uh, somewhat bizarre because uh, is it not the case that we take something for a fact, a scientific fact, when we have been able to repeatedly uh, prove that this cause led to this scientific result? Uh, and yet, suddenly, uh, there is a drop of standards here. Uh, so it is quite okay to say uh, okay, we don't have any biological tests, we don't have any biological markers for most of the categories in the DSM, yet uh, this is the way we want to go, <laughs> and we will get there. But it's not proven. Uh, so again, that means uh, we're a bit desperate, I think, in a way. So... Uh, the main aim of the DSM uh, is uh, to find, as I said earlier on, uh, a shared and a, a very clear language. And I think that is uh, the, the DSM-5 uh, is an improvement, uh, let's say, in relation to, to the DSM-4. But to have a clear, communicable language, a shared language, is not necessarily scientific. Um, in fact, in the DSM-4 and the DSM-5, there are no causes that have effects. So, that's not scientific. In fact, uh, there is only a medical condition or many medical conditions organized in spectra and clusters. Uh, and um, and they, uh, these uh, conditions are diagnosed on the basis of signs, uh, of, of symptoms uh, that we read as a sign, a sign of, let's say, an underlying uh, disorder. So, crucially, these uh, symptoms are not related to, or indeed do not function in uh, in relation to a structure. Uh, so that is very, very uh, typical for the DSM, that it is completely and utterly descriptive. It is not a structural diagnostic system. And that word structure is very important, and I, I will return to it, and I will uh, briefly talk about what, uh, what structure is, and what I mean by structure. But for example, uh, just to say here, that uh, the DSM is descriptive, uh, in other words, one syndrome or one form of psychopathology, does, it, it's not argued that that structurally relates 
to another form of psychopathology. In other words, there seems to be a, a continuum. A structure means that uh, you need to be able to argue what a structure is. In other words, what mechanisms are at stake in the structure that another structure does not have, and what elements are present in the structure that another structure, for example, does not have. That's, that's a real problem that we do not find in the DSM. The DSM-3 uh, uh, contained uh, references to, uh, to causes, which were biological, social, and psychological. The bio-psychosocial uh, model, uh, which is uh, well known, but interestingly, uh, no reference to etiology. And etiology means uh, how does a particular symptom or a particular psychopathology, how does it develop? How does it come about? What are its mechanisms that lead to a particular manifestation of, of a symptom or a uh, psychopathology? It's only in the uh, first DSMs uh, that we find reference, for example, to development, uh, de de developmental psychology. And so a lot of, uh, of the work uh, in psychology, developmental psychology, has disappeared. What we've discovered through research and, and work uh, with, uh, with children and families, a lot, a lot of what we've learned there has disappeared from, uh, from the DSM 3, 4 and 5. So, uh, so effectively, uh, psychology has been excluded from the last uh, DSMs, including uh, the DSM-5. So, um, so that's, that's a problem, I think. Um, the later DSMs, that is to say, DSM-4 and 5, uh, what they do, bizarrely enough, they collapse causes into their effects. And so far as they are visible and quantifiably measurable. In other words, they don't care if, uh, uh, you know, as long as we can measure uh, a symptom or a pathology, its severity, uh, you know, its form and so on, but it, 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 does not seem, it does not seem to care about what may actually cause it, except for that at some point we will find a biological cause. So all uh, the, the DSM measures, I think, is, uh, uh, is indeed uh, what we can uh, what we can measure. So, um, for, uh, 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 just a, an example that is a, a little bit close to my heart, and, and uh, because uh, I, I've uh, worked on, on the you know problem and I, what I think is a modern problem, uh, addiction, uh, and I, I worked uh, uh, for for nine ten years with uh, with addicts in a the therapeutic community, and uh, uh, for example, in the DSM. Addictive behavior causes addiction. So here's a, a, a perfect example uh, of how uh, cause and effect are collapsed into each other. So addictive behavior causes addiction. That's completely what's uh, elliptical or tautological to say that. It doesn't, it doesn't lead to any question of causation or etiology or what may cause somebody to behave addictively uh, and so on. Um, so, yeah. So a, a crucial consequence of the uh, scientific logic that grounds the DSM-4 um, is that when we apply it to the clinic, uh, what we call in psychoanalysis, the subject or subjectivity is excluded. But, uh, and th that's in a, in a way obvious, and that's, uh, and that's a, a lot of sort of general criticism on the DSM-4 and the DSM-5 that the subjectivity, the subjective experience, again, which we need to return to as to what that is, because it's not just necessarily how someone feels, but it's to do with uh, subjective responsibility. Also for how we recover or deal with mental illness, psychopathology, our suffering, uh, and so on. So that's, that is, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's a general criticism of the DSM, uh, but there is another one, uh, and that's why it's what I'm going to explore with you in the next sort of uh, 10, uh, 15 uh, minutes, and that is that uh, you exclude the subjectivity of the client or the patient, but it returns or something of this subjectivity returns via the clinician. And that, I think, is a problem. And that is the, the, the thing that I would like to add 
to uh, to to the criticisms of the, the DSM. In other words, when uh, a diagnostician, a psychiatrist, clinical psychologist, is confronted uh, with a client or a patient, uh, and he or she uses uh, the DSM, uh, he or she, as a clinician, has to make a choice. And choice, there is no way uh, that choice does not relate to who you are to some extent. That means your life, your experiences, your desire, uh, your experiences of yourself, uh, your immediate family, your partner perhaps, children, uh, parents. Uh, so one is confronted here with the most peculiar paradox uh, that when the sub subjective aspect of the patient is excluded, something of subjectivity returns to him via the clinician. And, as I said earlier on, this return of subjectivity via the clinician, and we're going we're gonna to ground this in a little bit of uh, philosophy and theory uh, in a minute, as I say, uh, that can have serious devastating uh, consequences. So, that leads me then uh, to, uh, to the question of what grounds uh, the DSM uh, what, um, what is the philosophy uh, behind the DSM? And uh, that's something that I was specifically interested in when, uh, uh, when I began to look at this and prepare for this uh, talk, this lecture tonight. Um, uh, you know, I, I wanted to know what is, it, what, is, what is the philosophy, what's the idea behind it? So, on a descriptive level, the DSM aims at detecting mental disorders in individuals on the basis of an inventory of such disorders. It's a bit like a, like a botanical system. For each disorder, so therefore, there are inclusion and exclusion criteria, and there are scales of severity, mild, uh, low, and severe, and uh, they're grouped in spectra and uh, clusters. Of course, these criteria... Uh, for inclusion and exclusion, these criteria for severity, uh, and uh, uh, all of these are, of course, nothing but major and minor symptoms that uh, patients display. And that we just read as signs, uh, so this, uh, this uh, particular symptom is a sign that he or she may well be suffering from this or that kind of pathology, but we need a few more signs that function in clusters and spectra. We put them together and then, yes, that's it. Here we have the diagnosis. So uh, what the DSM-5 says uh, is that uh, the roots of these, uh, these uh, let's say, the roots of these symptoms ultimately are situated in the biological sphere. Uh, so we are looking uh, voraciously for biological markers, which we still haven't found. So when we consider uh, symptoms, and here we go into a little bit of philosophy, but I'm going to keep it really simple. Uh, uh, you know, that's the way I can only understand it. That's, that's not a judgment on you, that's my problem. Uh, so uh, when we consider symptoms to be signs of an underlying condition, we are, whether we know it or not, involved in the reading of signs. So, uh, but signs are not just signs. We have to do something with them, and that is uh, what uh, uh, the... American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce said uh, that a sign is, represents something for someone. Charles Sanders Peirce is a really interesting philosopher. Uh, I, I predict that in the future he will become uh, increasingly more important. He is the founding father of pragmatism in American philosophy, which is very important for the logical positivist uh, method in doing science. Uh, and uh, very much liked by pragmatists, obviously, and skeptics, uh, and so on. And, uh, uh, you know, a, a very important figure in the philosophy of science, in other words. Uh, but he, he didn't only speak about uh, philosophy and, uh, and science, he was also a mathematician and a logician, and he always was very interested in language and science. And that's the statement that he made. 
So there are three elements. There is a sign that represents. Of course, a sign represents something, but it represents something for someone. The person for whom it represents something. So that's, uh, um, that's Charles Sanders Pierce. I can explain this a little bit further by uh, probably one of the most important uh, mathematicians we've had. Uh, he's a uh, Gottlob Frege, a 19th century logician and mathematician. And again, I'm going to keep this uh, simple uh, because this is the way I understand it, so I can, of course, only communicate the way I understand it. He said uh, there are three, because Gottlob Frege, as a logician and a mathematician, he was also interested, interestingly, in signs and language. And he said, uh, he named three aspects of the sign. There is the sense uh, uh, aspect of the sign. Two is, there is what it represents. Of course, that's the referent or the object that it represents. And then the person for who it represents something. So it's very similar to Charles Sanders Spears. In other words, he called that, so the, the one who receives the sign, for whom uh, this object means something, that's, that's what he called the representation or the idea of the sign. So to repeat, uh, the sign is the sense, the meaning. Huh? Uh, a meaning always refers to an object, uh, the referent, and then obviously uh, a referent means something for someone, and that's the representation or the idea of the sign. Uh, so Frege gives an example. Uh, he uh, wants to distinguish between referent, uh, namely the thing or object it represents, and uh, the sense aspect. And the example that he gives is uh, there is a morning star and there is an evening star. They are the same star, the morning star and the evening star. In other words, they have the same reference. In other words, a thing or object they refer to is the same thing. Uh, depending, of course, on whether it's morning or whether it is evening. Uh, but it's the, the star remains the same. That's really interesting because, of course... Uh, the referent is the same, but the sense changes. Because a star in the evening has a little different sense or meaning to us than the star, let's say, in the morning. So what's really interesting about that is that uh, signs, qua meaning, qua sense, not qua what they refer to necessarily, but qua sense or meaning, are very, very unstable. So that is important because if, uh, if what the DSM wants us to do, and that's what it wants us to do, it wants us to read symptoms as signs, then we are involved in an unstable domain. Because as you know, as you can see there, the meaning or the sense of signs can change. Now, I'm not going to go down this route, uh, uh, but, be, but that is a problem in and of itself. But I want to introduce another problem. Yeah, one that I've referred to already before, which I think is even more problematic than the instability of, of signs, of symptoms that we have to read as signs. The idea of a sign, that is uh, the, 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 the representation or the idea, that is to say, the one uh, related, uh, that is to say, what happens to the one who receives the sign, uh, Frege says that it concerns what takes shape in his or her mind, and he says that's not unrelated to an individual's experiences. Uh, it has to do with uh, memories based on experiences, impressions based on experiences. He says, Frege says, it's his own words, it's imbued with uh, feeling. Frege then adds that the uh, idea or the representation of the sign is subjective. There's a subjective element to it. In other words, he says, and it's again his quote, uh, one man's or woman's idea of a sign uh, is not another's. Stein van Heulen, uh, I, I don't have his uh, name here on the, on the PowerPoint, but he's a colleague uh, from the psychology department in the University of Ghent. Uh, and he, he has done 
uh, some work and he will uh, he is going to publish a book on uh, the DSM uh, it's going to be published in a year or two with Paul Grave. He makes the point that this latter aspect of the sign, let's say the subjective aspect of reading the sign, is excluded precisely from the DSM. Individual complaints are transposed uh, or translated in a coded uh, language. The idea, of course, is that, uh, that we would enhance uh, the reliability uh, and, of course, the clearer we get everything coordinated and that, uh, that has improved with the DSM-5, uh, the more reliability will be enhanced. Uh, ratings, uh, inter-rater inter uh, uh, inter should be much better. So, um, the only thing is, uh, so far, uh, the, the predictions are that it will improve, but so far we haven't improved uh, much in terms of reliability and indeed validity. So, when individual symptoms uh, uh, are translated into a standard code, again, the element of subjectivity, of subjective experience of the patient, of the client, is excluded. In psychoanalysis, subjectivity concerns, as I said, the question as to how is one implied uh, in, uh, in one's suffering. In other words, it, as I said, it, it pertains to the question of subjective responsibility. But let's leave that aside for the moment and we may, we may come back to it uh, when, when I talk a little bit about symptoms and diagnosis in, uh, in, in, in Lacan. When the receiver of the sign, what Frege calls the representation or the idea of the sign, uh, it, when the clinician is asked not to receive it, because that's exactly what the DSM does, it says, yes, it refers to something, i.e. the referent, uh, and there is uh, the, the symptom as a sign has a meaning because it, it relates to the referent, but what you have to exclude is that you receive it uh, perhaps in a way related to your experiences. In other words, uh, you have to exclude your subjectivity. So the, the, uh, the DSM demands that the clinician excludes the idea or representational aspect of the sign. That's an impossible situation. Uh, for example, uh, imagine... A clinician with a patient who presents with a series of complaints. Uh, I have no appetite. Uh, I can't sleep very well. I have no interest in sex. I feel low-key. I have no hunger. I have no confidence in the future. Uh, I have little interest in relationship. And this seems to persist now for a good couple of days. You would think that uh, that you know that leads to uh, you know uh, a diagnosis of depression. Yet <coughs> that is not happening. Bizarrely enough, um, and we've looked at this. This has been tested. Why precisely? Because the diagnosis ultimately depends on the idea or the representational aspect of the sign not just on the sense and the thing that it refers to. In other words, for example, if the, this person, patient, uh, client, uh, is talking to the psychiatrist or clinical psychologist, and the clinical psychologist or psychiatrist, him or herself, has had moments of depression, has a partner, uh, he or she, who had moments of depression, has children, perhaps, and so on, all of that, of course, has an effect. In other words, uh, these are the experiences, the memories, the background against which a choice is made. And don't forget, we like to exclude the element of choice uh, you know, from the DSM uh, by the, the clinician, yet you have to make a choice. Because if somebody tells you these things, these signs, these symptoms that you read as signs, you make a choice. You have to choose, well, depression or uh, it's actually okay, I mean, it's normal to go through moments like that. That's the problem. That's why, despite all the effort and money, there is very little reliability and validity in the DSM. And I suspect 
that, again, my prediction is that uh, reliability will improve a little bit, but validity will, will uh, sink. Okay, so I need, to, I, need to, I need to introduce something else, namely, you know, because I said I think we need diagnosis, I think we need classification, uh, uh, and uh, so what can that be? And, and what I'm going to talk about now uh, is... How much time do I have? Oh, it's already 7 o'clock. Um, what um, I, I'm going to try and uh, put it a little bit short uh, so uh, I am not saying this is uh, a better way or this is the best way but there is another way and I, I think ultimately we need to find another way um, how, how much time how, how long am I allowed to go on you can start Oh, okay, okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, symptoms, you could, you could consider symptoms as personal constructs uh, in that they uh, construct sense out of painful experiences and conflict and they're personal and, uh, uh, and they are unique to the individual uh, and they are inaccessible to anyone else. Now, does that mean when we uh, define symptoms like that, does that mean that, uh, uh, you know, that we, we can't do diagnosis? After all, uh, if symptoms are unique and inaccessible to anyone else, we cannot use them to relate them to a diagnostic category. The question is no. Uh, diagnosis is hugely important. And that leads to the question as to what is a symptom? How does it function? How can we make it function? What I'm saying is, I'm going to cut, thing, cut things a little bit short because I'm, I'm running out of time. We can, rather than read them as signs, uh, as signs to be related to an underlying disorder, we can make symptoms speak. We can uh, uh, allow them to join in the conversation. Let's say that takes place between a therapist or a counselor or a psychoanalyst, if you wish, and a client or a patient. And what happens then is that uh, interestingly, over time, when that happens, uh, these symptoms can be related to various kinds of experiences and aspects of uh, someone's life. In other words, what do we do? We put the symptom to work. So, um, a symptom, of course, again, is a social, it is debilitating, uh, and, uh, but by making it part of a dialogue or making it part of a, a conversation, by allowing the symptom to speak and allowing it to become part of the conversation, it becomes, as it were, socialized, and that can lead to various uh, kinds of changes. One can, in fact, learn from these symptoms, uh, one can learn via these symptoms about one's experiences and about one's, uh, one's life. You could say that a symptom is a language on its own uh, and it, it, it sort of functions as a parasite uh, because, of course, it makes the client or the patient suffer. But by uh, allowing it to speak, allowing it to join in the conversation, it can lose some of its injurious uh, parasitic value, as it were. And in actual fact, uh, as you know, I say uh, psychoanalysis, but it's not necessarily psychoanalysis. We see this uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in the domain of intellectual disability, for example, because the discourse there in intellectual disability is, you know, how, uh, how can, what purpose do these symptoms serve? How can, how can we, uh, you know, how do these uh, help the patient, for example? So it's, it's nothing new. So, you know, that's what I'm talking about. So, symptoms are enormously important uh, for psychoanalysis. <coughs> Making them speak, trying to relate them to the lives and the experiences of the individual is absolutely paramount. So, in psychoanalysis, a symptom is not a sign of an underlying disorder, but... Uh, it, it's rather something that represents or signifies something of the life of a client or a patient. Very few patients, very few people rather, sorry, escape symptoms. Uh, so in psychoanalysis we don't think, uh, we, we don't really believe in normality that, uh, that much. But that does not mean that there is no method in madness, that there is no method in our uh, madness. 
uh, and I mean the madness that psychoanalysis is perhaps, but also uh, in madness itself there is method. And with that we have uh, a, you know, uh, arrived at what are the structures? What are structures? The structures uh, that we think of in psychoanalysis are neurosis, psychosis, and perversion. And the symptoms precisely have a function in relation to these uh, structures. So, in other words, uh, a, a, a symptom in psychosis is related to what makes up the structure of psychosis. Uh, for example, a symptom in neurosis uh, is related to the structure uh, of neurosis itself, which is quite different than the structure of psychosis, and so it has a different function. In other words, by relating the symptom to the structure, uh, uh, we can actually, um, uh, how do I say it, we can actually uh, discern how a symptom functions, what purpose it serves, and if it in, is in, indeed in very injurious and parasitic, uh, can we, uh, uh, via the conversation and the dialogue, by letting the symptom join in the conversation, can we uh, divert the symptom away from its injurious aspect and actually make it work for us? Or indeed, can we dissolve it? Because that's also uh, possible. I'm going to leave out the question of structure uh, as to what, uh, what that is because uh, um, I want to uh, come to uh, a case and, then I want, and I want to finish up then. So, the, um, so we could say that the symptoms uh, uh, and the, the structures that uh, underlie the symptoms, they're not deficits necessarily, but they're productions and productions that we can uh, work with. Uh, so analysts have to make diagnosis uh, because, for example, if you're going to work with somebody who has a psychotic structure and you make interventions or you say things that, uh, that, come fr uh, th that are more appropriate to, to a neurosis, you can, for example, uh, trigger uh, a psychotic break. So it is very, very important that we get it right and that we get our diagnosis uh, right. Uh, to get it right, to get the diagnosis uh, right is crucial. But that does not mean that you diagnose on the basis of reading a symptom as a sign. You take your time. You may be wrong. It may sometimes take months. It may sometimes take a year or longer to diagnose. Sometimes you may have to change your position. Uh, I've, I've worked with, uh, with people, for example, uh, and after uh, a year or so, I had to change my position uh, because I realized on the basis, in fact, of one sp uh, specific case that I'm thinking of, of one thing she said, which symbolized exactly her position, this is uh, a, a probably a case of psychosis. And so I changed my, my relationship with her, my interventions with her, and, uh, and, and suddenly the therapy uh, uh, went much better. I don't really have time uh, to uh, talk about this uh, case. Very briefly, I'll summarize this. This concerns uh, a 28-year-old man who took out his eye, threw it in the bin, and obviously... Um, uh, he, he said he had uh, strange bad thoughts on the day that it happened. He ended up in psychiatry. Um, they couldn't find any psychopathological development, uh, so no signs of psychiatric disposition and so on. Uh, in, uh, at some point in 1994, he developed delusions uh, and uh, he, he thought he was Satan, he was going to be crucified. And uh, during this schizophrenic episode, he committed his first suicide attempt. He was placed under psychiatric care with the diagnosis of schizophrenic psychosis, subtype paranoia. He was discharged in complete remission. Then they reconstructed the orbit, so he had done a lot of damage, and uh, he ended up again in the psychiatric department, and then uh, he, uh, he said... Uh, uh, so he had again del delusions and, and, uh, and thought he was Satan and uh, he was sleep he had insomnia and so on and he said he was using marijuana and amphetamines uh, 
And then it transpired, in fact, that he, over a period of about 10 years, he quite consistently had used uh, marijuana and amphetamines. And he immediately changed the diagnosis to drug-induced psychosis. Now, that's very, very interesting. That conclusion is truly interesting. Why? Because, of course, drugs can induce psychotic-type phenomena. We know that. Uh, we know that sometimes people take certain drugs and they jump off a rope and so on. That can happen. But my question is, can drugs, or the effect of drugs, can they produce a psychotic structure? And I, I think that is not the case. Uh, drugs can mimic psychosis incredibly well. But you cannot, through drug use and drug effects, create a psychotic structure. But what drugs can do is they can, if there is a psychotic structure, trigger a psychotic breakdown. Now, if this young man had been properly diagnosed, uh, um, you know, and, and, and uh, they would ha have worked with him and perhaps listened to him for a while, they may have heard a couple of things he would have said to them and talk about his experiences, and they would have said, this young man has a psychotic structure. And if that was the case, he could have been helped, he could have been helped much, much better. Uh, they could have uh, intervened in a different way. They could have given him different medication and psychoanalysis. We would reposition ourselves in relation to the psychotic patient and we would not make equivocal interpretations as you sometimes do with neurotics in, uh, in psychoanalysis. So um, I need to conclude because it's time. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to leave out how Lacan diagnosed, because uh, Lacan very much warned against, uh, you know, he was a psychiatrist and worked with, uh, uh, you know, taught young psychiatrists, and he always warned for be very, very careful uh, that when some, something comes across as this, it must be this, uh, and so on, always case by case. Be very careful, listen to them, work with them, and always logically work it out. So, so there is a logic and it needs to be clinically verified. So you, it, it is really crucial that you take your time. So as I say, a diagnosis should be a working hypothesis. So uh, I, will, I want to finish up uh, with a question uh, that, uh, that, that came to me when, when I, I was preparing for to, tonight's lecture. And it's a question I, I haven't been able to resolve uh, at all, and I'm putting it to you. Uh, and it is, is the following. You know, the S from the DSM stands for statistical. And you know that quantitative methods, statistical and quantitative methods, do not require a clinical logic. Uh, you know, uh, in other words, they, they yield results, whatever you do. So we can apply this method to any category any psychiatric category that we come up with. And keep in mind, uh, although I suppose I haven't said it yet, uh, you know, obviously I've read the DSM and the history of the DSM and about the committees and so on, uh, the, the categories uh, to be scientifically verified were decided by convention in committees. So it is, in a way, quite arbitrary. So it was decided by convention. So if we do a statistical uh, analysis on these categories, whatever they are, and here's my question, what does that statistically acquired result actually refer to? Is it the outcome of a numerical analysis on an arbitrary word, and does a result that <coughs> would one get to say it again, no matter what? No matter what. So my question is, is the DSM uh, a word for a disorder, no matter what? Yeah. So for me, the reliability aspect uh, is not so much a problem, it's the validity aspect. What clinical reality does it actually refer to, uh, the DSM? Thank you very much for listening and, and apologies for going over time a little bit. Thank you.